All right, Jordan, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Um, we were talking a little bit before, and I mentioned we're just going to go straight into lavishing the praise here, if you don't mind. <laughs> Is that okay? Have you heard too I'm gonna much? Start, I'm going to start shrinking in my chair because I'm... <laughs> Have you heard too much already, though? Because I'm trying to come up with unique praise because I've been listening to you on the Around the NFL pod, uh, Barnwell's pod. Although I don't, Barnwell, did he even, did he, he only listened to like two episodes or something. Come on. Hopefully Bill, he's through the rest of it by <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get it together, buddy. Um, I'm sure you've been on a few others that I haven't, I haven't listened to. So I'm going to try to keep something unique. And from my perspective, um, you now are part of the New York times. My wife actually works for the New York times. She does the, the daily podcast. She's like one of the, the editors there. And she had worked at NPR and some other narrative type of podcasts in the past. And what I'll tell you is, and this is something that comes up with, with her a lot. I mean, a lot of work goes into their, even their interview podcast, but when they're doing something with, um, just when they're interviewing like a reporter, not actually going out into the field, but when they're doing those, it's so much time and so much effort. And like, it builds up the brand of the show, but at the same point in time, you know, there's always like, is the juice worth the squeeze sort of thing. So I have to say for, from your perspective, I mean, I'm hoping that whatever, you know, numbers, uh, you know, aside that you're pretty happy about this. Cause it seems like you've, this has had a really big impact. And I think it's kind of a scary thing that I'm sure you put in more time than you ever would have imagined into this. And you don't really know when it comes out kind of how big of an impact it's going to have. And I think you've kind of captured uh, the zeitgeist or whatever you want to say in the off season <laughs> here for, w with this podcast series. Well, thank you very much for saying that. And also like, thank you for recognizing that too, that <laughs> how much work does go into it. Um, and you've seen it firsthand, obviously, but like that, it was really interesting. I would joke with one of my uh, EPs a lot about my smelts about how, um, because so he had, he was obviously focusing big picture at the same time as we're making the show. And I'm so in a tunnel on pro the process of it that by the time I sort of like came up for oxygen, um, you know, a week before this year, when we lock everything in and a week before when it's actually three dimensional and it's starting to feel real, I became deeply fearful, <laughs> <laughs> horrifically anxious, right? Just like all out, just like pure panic because not because I was worried about whether or not um, it was going to be good. I, I didn't know what to think about it. I just knew that it felt right. It felt like, you know, I wanted to show identity through football. I wanted to show football through identity and have people share that and their stories in their own words. And, and to get people talking about this subject that really has become in, you know, so entrenched in their molecular <laughs> DNA um, as coaches and, have that just show itself in a way that felt um, natural and, and, you know, decentered me as the reporter. And I think sometimes in written format reporters and, and football and everything, we can get so invested in what we're talking about that sometimes we almost become, uh, you know, as the writer, a part of the story. But in this series, what I'm really proud of is that these characters, and I do call them characters for a variety of, of meanings. <laughs> um, these characters are all, they're, they're all so, um, they're sort of seeking and discovering themselves along the way through the course of the conversations and, and through the way that we put things together. And so I was so invested in that process and Mike Smeltz, my EP would joke with me, be like, wow, you're turning into one of these people because you're, you're like the coaching cliche, like be where your feet are and process over results. And I'm, I'm overwhelmed and so grateful that people seem to be enjoying it. And I've heard from a lot of people around the league, which is always a pleasant surprise, when, especially when the subjects you talk to, like, don't want to murder you after this thing comes out. <laughs> always helpful. But yeah, it's um, it, it was just really I'm, I'm so grateful, so overwhelmed. Um, and but but yeah, I, I really was just sort of in a tunnel thinking about how to create this thing for so long that I'm almost like blinking in the sunlight for the first time here. Yeah, yeah. Well, a deserved uh deserved little break from having to do that and also dropping them all at the same time. I'll give you credit for that too. Cause I know it's people are of two minds as to whether that's better or not. You know, I think in audio, it is better because you want to just like binge and, and get through it. I don't know if you have the same sort of like appointment viewing, because even if you dropped them one at a time, it's not like a Sunday night HBO type of thing. It just shows up on someone's feed and, and, and they get to whatever. <laughs> so, so congratulations for that. That's another thing where I have seen firsthand, uh, from my wife where it's like, ideally they would do that. And then it ends up being like working all night. Like you put the first episode out and then you're like making the second episode in that one week <laughs> after spending months <laughs> on the, on the first episode sort of thing. So congratulations for that. And 
when you talk about taking on their personalities, um, were you like dropping some MFers on people when they weren't <laughs> do when they were doing correctly? Is that what was going on or what? No, you know what? It was so funny. The complete opposite of what those <laughs> dynamics were in Houston and Washington and Atlanta and everywhere else these guys have been, like my producers, Mike Smeltz, Ken Garrison, and I, we had the total opposite. Like I'm on a four-stop red eye from San Jose into Green Bay. And I'm getting, I'm, I'm waking up in the Austin airport to really supportive texts. My producers have set alarms so that they can be awake when I'm awake, like to make sure that I feel supported and energized, ready to go take a, a sink shower in the Green Bay airport and go interview Matt LaFleur, like, you know, directly from there. Like they just, they were so, it was such, it was, it was functional. Like it was so, we would laugh about this all the time because um, it was so creatively empowering in similar ways that, you know, part of the story dives into how creatively empowering some of that, that coaches own lives have been in terms of when they worked with each other, but total opposite from how they were just at each other all the time. It was actually, it, it was so cool to work with a team of really smart, really bright people who understood the vision and, and basically said, Hey, we are going to support the story that you want to tell. We're going to give you the tools to, to tell that the best way that you can. And they did. I mean, the sound design, we have so many Easter eggs in there that inform the parts of the series and um, little things that we really wanted to um, democratize some of the ideas that people were talking about. You know, I think, you know, a lot of times when we hear think conceptually things about football, it feels very far away. Right. And it feels like there are people who have access to those ideas and there are people who don't have access to those ideas. And that's a big theme explored throughout the course of the series as well. And what I wanted people to feel like they were in there with me being ranted at by Kyle Shanahan, because you can actually hear his chair squeaking and you can hear the, the, sound, the, the swipe on the whiteboard behind him. And those types of little details, we just wanted to be totally immersive for people to feel like they're, they're literally sitting there having people talk about football with them, not necessarily at them or through a screen or through your AirPods or whatever, but like that you feel there. Um, because having access to those ideas and having access to um, to the sport that we all love was was really really important to me. Okay, so let's let me, maybe I've I've kind of dove into to some of this uh, process related stuff. So let's take a step back at first. <laughs> and part of this is is kind of what you already talked about though, as far as being the storyteller. Um, and I know you've mentioned on some podcasts not liking to hear your own voice. I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I <laughs> relate to that a little bit. Here. I have some clips. I tried to minimize you not having to listen to yourself add that much in the clip. So maybe one clip that has a piece of you in there. But like being able to get their voices and in a fairly like candid manner. And I think there is something about audio maybe as a format which helps a little bit there. Something about not having like the press conference sort of format. And when you're a reporter. As you said, sometimes probably more so nowadays, I think the reporters, even if it's not an opinion type of reporter, you know, so, some takes kind of seep their way in there because let's face it, these guys are not giving us a lot. OK, they're at their press conferences, sometimes on purpose. Right. They're not giving us a lot, but you got a lot out of them. So how are you able to, I guess, pitch this to them in a way <laughs> that that would happen or. Are they were they just naturally willing to open? I, I might McDaniel, you could probably just like show up at his house and, and put a <laughs> microphone there and just record everything he does 24 hours a day and he wouldn't care. Um, but for some of these other guys, I know Kyle Shanahan at least has been guarded. I saw him on the Chris Sims, I don't know, it was a podcast or something like that. He's friends and he was reticent even to do that because he doesn't want to get aggregated and things like that. So how how did how did this idea come to life? And the most important thing is really, you know, having the story to tell in the first place. In other words, getting it from them, from the horse's mouth. Yeah, I, I knew what kind of story I wanted to tell. And I just told them what kind of story I wanted to tell. And, and you're totally right. Mike was so open. You know, I've covered Sean McVay for years and years here in Los Angeles. So he understood what I was trying to accomplish. But other people I, I actually, you know, didn't know very well. You know, I talked, we talked to Kyle Shanahan two, three times a year on opposing coach conference calls. Matt LaFleur, because the Rams always seem to be in Green Bay, um, talked to him every year on conference calls have done bigger picture features that sometimes focus on these guys as, you know, auxiliary characters, you know, that we've crossed paths, but to, to be able to trust someone to sit down and tell you the story. So a lot of it was like having conversations on background and mm -hmm. 
asking, by the way, some very patient PR people across the league over and over and over and over and over again for months and months and months. Um, so when, when did it all start? When, when did this when did this all start? I mean, I'm sure with McVay, we're talking about obviously the relationship that's been extended mm -hmm. for a while. But as far as this idea really being, you know, green lit and, and pushed forward. Yeah, I pitched the idea. I had the the idea started forming back in 2020, although it didn't manifest fully into this specific concept um, mm -hmm. for a while. But in um, last last off season, um, after we had done the Andrew Luck podcast with the Athletic, Zach Kiefer, who did a wonderful job on that, and same EP, Mike Smeltz, um, I wanted to try that, and I, I thought that this might be. I'd had this idea marinating for for years, as I said. Um, about how football collides with itself and how the people within the sport collide with each other and create new things out of those collisions. Um, and, and how interesting that looking at a specific small set of tree rings um, within the sports timeline could really display that um, very, very whole, um, very, very wholly to people in a way that maybe they hadn't considered it before. And so I just was, I pitched it and they said, yes, go ahead and give it a shot. Uh, and, and like the reporting process started almost a year ago. And so, you know, as I go into camps now, I'm sitting there thinking, well, what, what the heck am I going to do this year? You know, like, <laughs> relax. Like, That's right? what you're going to do. I, so yeah. stuff, and like, but, but it's months and months and months of talking through. And then obviously there's a time when you try to reach people in the coaching life because they don't there's nothing but football during football time. Right. So yeah. there are different periods of time, you know, Mike McDaniel and I, we sat down at the combine, whereas, you know, Kevin O'Connell and I sat down at league meetings, whereas Sean McVay and I sit down at the start of OTAs, whereas, you know, Kyle and Matt sort of um, navigating logistically their interviews was um, an experience. I probably don't want to relive in terms of the amount of flying and sleeping on very uncomfortable chairs that I did, but um, it was, it was all like uh, an ongoing conversation for a really long time. And then that conversation carries over because just cause I get in the room doesn't mean they're actually going to do it. You know, I mean, they could yeah. say, they could have said, they could say um, actually, you know what? I don't know that I'm comfortable with this, or I don't know that um, I, I'm going to be in a place to open up this much, but what it was at its core. And I had this theory and this hunch that, these guys, it's the, it's like their oxygen football is, is, is who they are in a way that sometimes I don't think they even understand. And they're showing that to us with everything they do and sometimes inadvertently and for better and also for worse. And so I explained that to them. I was like, I think there's some darkness here, but I also think that mainly this is, this is a story about football, about a moment in football's timeline being preserved in time and explaining it to people in a way that, you know, you walk out of any of those rooms and you just think, okay, I get it. Um, and that's part of it too, is, is all of these guys um, in part because of how they spent their time with each other, um, you know, back in their very most formative years of coaching, they're all really good at teaching and explaining and, and talking about process. And again, the detail fixation that all of them have, it comes through so naturally, they don't even recognize sometimes that they're doing it. And so it's providing a space where, you know, you are continuing the conversation versus, you know, stopping it, diverting it, anything like that. For me, it was, again, it was about very much about removing myself almost, almost, you know, wanting to be an active listener and all of that, but removing myself from even the interview process, because it was never, it's not about me. It's about these ideas and concepts that they're literally making tangible in the air as they talk because of how they're describing and layering details. Um, and so for me, I just think it was, it's how they are. And, and I think we definitely don't see that at the podiums, anything like that, but you know, it's something that I had suspected and didn't quite know what I would get. Um, and then just sort of jumped. Yeah. Yeah. No, what I think was really like, again, this is more of the, we're going, we're going back into the praise section of this. So you know, <laughs> I'm sinking but, in my chair again. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what I thought you, you nailed on this and it was more in a way where I was a little like going into it. There are these very dominant like narratives around the genius of let's say Kyle Shanahan and McVay and others. And my worry about it going into this, not about you, anything with you personally, but just generally was you could tell this story of this is why this person's so different than anywhere else. And this is why it was like almost destined for success because of this and because of this. And that's how we often 
kind of paint these narratives in after something happens. Like the results of one game can shift you from saying this coach is a genius to this coach will never win the Super Bowl because of a couple <laughs> of plays that went a certain a certain direction. But what I thought was good about it is it was very specific in using the stories of these individuals. But I also felt like I learned a lot about just coaching generally and the mindset that these guys have and, and how they diagnose things. They may be doing it to a different degree or on a higher or lower level than some others. But I think all coaches are thinking about these things and thinking about constantly being ahead and never being able to rest on your laurels and having to collaborate um, with certain certain players, which may be more or less willing to come along with what you're doing. I thought there was so much that actually applies outside of the stories of these individuals to the larger NFL. And you just don't hear everyone be this frank and open with their individual stories, which would have a lot of similarities. Yeah. Thank you for saying that because that was so crucial to me is to not make this a series about praising people. Um, it's a series about how people are and why yeah. they are. And, and because, and, and honestly, if, if I, it could have so easily gone the other way if they weren't so open through the course of the, the interview process um, which I don't think was intentional at all, but I think it, cause who doesn't like to be praised, right? Except yeah. for me as I sink in my chair. Um, <laughs> but, but so like it could have so easily, but I approached them all with the frank and very blunt comment that like, I think there is an inherent darkness to what they do. Mm -hmm. I think that football is a cruel and punishing sport and it demands a human toll. And it's it, 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 in, in innovation, the cost comes due constantly. And there's so many ways to explore that and look at that. And I also said to Kyle Shanahan that I don't, I don't believe that there are geniuses in football. Um, and he agreed with me. I said, I think that there are people who um, are extremely attentive to detail, are ridiculously passionate about how those details all work together and they can see se sequencing, they can see patterns, they understand people, they might have gifts of empathy or consideration or any number of, of things that make people brilliant coaches. Um, but but I don't. I said I don't think that there are are geniuses in in football. I think that it's a combination of a lot of things and a lot of a lot of freaking work. And um, he he agreed with me. And so for me, that set a tone immediately where it was like you know I think that this you know you you'd obviously don't want to diminish what people are able to achieve, whether it's a coach or a player or a front office person. But at the same time, I, I, I was, if we go back to the concept of like being af you know, afraid before this thing comes out, sure. that was one thing I worried about is that people would look at it at the surface and like this awesome artwork illustrated that our design team did, which says so much, by the way, just with very, very simple imagery. Um, I was worried that people would see it and be like, oh, great. Like, here's the fun bunch again, you know, like another, and, and, but I wanted to come right out of the gate swinging saying, this is not that. And that's why we started with Kyle in his office because immediately you're struck by, Oh, this person might not be well, <laughs> but, but also, wow, they're functioning at a very high level. So yeah. you're immediately just like hit in the face with that very specific and, and nuanced thing that again, I don't think works necessarily in another medium because you have to hear it to believe it right yeah yeah okay well, i, I want to talk about all of the the characters and i have to, I, like I, i'm even reticent to say kyle kind of gives you know he, he does give some stuff naturally i can see why he would not want to necessarily be part of a lot of interviews in fact we talk about like this darkness and dedication to the game um at the very beginning which i i didn't clip here but the very beginning when he's talking about you know that he gives his life to the game he kind of like it almost pings in his mind. He's like, oh, yeah, like my family, of course, is the most important thing. Right. But and I was like, is it like not that it isn't, but you know what I mean? Like they're they're I don't know what these guys these guys are not normal people. OK, they're not normal in the same sort of way. Even someone who is so involved in something, it's almost like uh I don't know how to describe it, like maybe an artist of some sort or someone who's just so dedicated to what they do that. It, it isn't a normal, it isn't a normal sort of thing. And of course, like he says, the, the last thing you think about is family. But I think very closely after that, he might be thinking about some sort of something football related that time. I don't know if you, if you got that sense too, but that's what I picked out uh, when I, a lot, a lot with him is just how maniacal he is as far as his focus on everything. 
Yeah, that part was uh, a real moment of clarity in the interview itself, too. You know, as you're through the course of this, you're trying not to react to anything, obviously, because you want to have the space be filled by the other person's voice and ideas and thoughts. And you're giving them that space. You created that um, that place for them for them to go. Um, and uh, <laughs> I did get a text from a, a, a league, a person across the league uh, after the series came out. It's like. Wow, five minutes into episode one, Kyle's already talking about death. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, that was like the Jimmy Garoppolo thing. If we don't know if any of us will will be alive in a couple of months, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. So it's it is a unique existence, and like I said, it was so important to show that right away um, that you're not entering a normal place. Like what we see on the field is is very, a very small moment of the obsessiveness that happens behind the scenes throughout the course of the entire week. And then it's so Sisyphean too, because everything starts all over again, you know, sun Sunday night, not even Monday morning. And so there's, there is a, um, a natural, they catch themselves sometimes digging too deep in that part of their brains through the course of the interviews. You can hear it with each of them, actually. Um, you know, it, you can hear them start to go into that place a little bit and then they bring themselves out because you're among normal company, right? So you can't, yeah. Yeah. but, um, but, but it's, it's very, it's very interesting. Um, you know, Raheem Morris at the start of, of episode five, he even has an argument with himself, um, through the interview because, um, he was trying to find the right word for what it is, how their brains operate, how coaches think, how, how, what it requires of you to exist and, and be successful in this very unique space. And um, he kept coming back to the, the word, I had used the word obsessive and he was trying. So he wanted to find a different word or a different set of words that wasn't that word, but, but then he sort of started to reconcile with himself through the course of the interview and you can hear it. Um, it's like, maybe that is the right word. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think in, in a certain way, it's probably hard to reach the pinnacle of any sort of endeavor where you have so many people. I mean, let's that's another thing I think that's interesting about the four coaches contrasted to each other is that personality wise, I don't know if they're actually very similar in a lot of ways, but then there are these very specific things when it comes to being detail oriented and obsessive and those things that come through, but yet from a bunch of different angles, going back to, to Kyle for, for a second here. So what I, what I think is what came out to me more so than I even would have thought going into this is maybe how different he is from the, from the others, despite the fact that he's probably grouped in there. He's probably seen as being, millennials come up in there. I don't know if he's quite, he, like he doesn't seem millennial. He seems like a mix of like Gen X and maybe even getting into like boomer sort of thing coming back from like his dad. He's been an office coordinator since 2008. I mean, having the reins on there and then having so much exposure before that where he really comes off as being a little bit more of an old school, even in his type of mentality, even how he, how he looks at things. But yet I think he gets grouped in with these guys, even though even his relationship with them has been very much in a hierarchical sort of way of, of being bottom down, you know, looking down and having them work for him most of the time. Yeah. You, if you listen to, and I, and I know you've considered this as well, um, cause we talked about it, but like when you, yeah. when you listen to how they talk, sometimes when Kyle talks about process, it's very process, right? With mm -hmm. no hierarchy inserted or established. But sometimes when other people talk about process and similar concepts or ideas, there the hierarchy, the 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 question sneaks in whether they mean to do it or not. And I think that comes with the fundamental starting point of all of their friendships with each other um, as complicated as they have been over the years, um, it started with competing with each other under Kyle um, and him training them and letting them into his world that was because of his dad and then also because of his placement in Tampa Bay so early in his career um, was a larger pool of knowledge than almost anybody, access to knowledge than frankly anybody in the league at that time had direct access to when you combine those elements together. And so then you're autom he's automatically has established that sort of hierarchy, not just because of the nature and the structure of his position as like their boss, but, but also because they're competing with each other to get calls on his call sheet. 
and they're competing with each other to get ideas into the game plan. And he has the final say. So even as they split apart and have their own identities, um, the, the sport's natural inherent push toward competition always, um, it, 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 you can't help but be reminded of that type of hierarchy. And Kyle's also the one, though, that I would say I kind of was starting to at certain points refer to him as like the long haul trucker of the group, <laughs> right. not just not just because of the hat, but also because right. you can feel he has accepted he has accepted the toll. Whereas some coaches, and I think Sean McVay being a recent example of this, they struggle with what the toll is of being successful in this place. And Kyle has accepted right, the retirement, it. The, the retirement story yeah. and mm -hmm. everything else that's going on. Yeah. 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 And Kyle, I think is Kyle has accepted what it costs in a way that um, wouldn't even begin to psycho psychoanalyze how, you know, what that means for for him. But but he's sort of accepted that in a way that you do see from a lot of really old school coaches or coaches that have had that longevity in the league. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it. His dad probably had some similar sort of philosophies, and I think we have seen other coaches. And this, I, I thought about this with with McVeigh. If he was like, if he was to step away, I mean, he could come back, right? Like, it's not like there wouldn't be wouldn't be the first person then to come back. And we have seen that sometimes, even if it's someone like I think like a Bill Parcells or someone like that, they might be successful, step away, and then come back in that sort of way. But there's some that you know they're either gonna gonna die or be fired and that's the only way that they're getting out of that chair and i would say that that kyle's dad is probably more of, of one of those sorts of sorts of guys and the first thing they'll think about is their family but a close right. second is football right <laughs> yes definitely definitely one of the things that's interesting about kyle is i i've been a little bit of a like a, a skeptic in a way because i think that he's a great offensive play caller but some of the stuff that we've seen and again, when we get into some of the nerd stuff and I was kind of wondering like how much nerd stuff could make it into this podcast, but let's be honest, like we just, it's, it's no fun. Well, we're not fun. We're not fun people. Like we just <laughs> rain on the parade. Basically we're like, excuse me, actually that's not true. Like something else. So, so there's nothing to go, but I thought it was interesting when I heard, I'm going to play a clip here where he's talking with his dad about um, allowing, like calling a Hail Mary at the end of the game. And I think it's interesting because it kind of goes a little bit of the evolution of thinking and maybe some things that even we don't think about where we're thinking about, you know, what's the optimal way, what goes on and, and things that he kind of learned through there. So I'm going to play him talking about calling Hail Marys at the end of the play and how his dad, you know, gently, of course, you know, and so, 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 so caringly uh, comes back at him when, when he brings this up. My dad would get mad at me every second quarter when I call Hail Mary from the 50. And he'd be like, why do you keep doing that? Like, cause there's no time. We might as well have a chance because they, they never work. And I was like, I know, but what's the harm in it? It might work. He goes, I've called plays long enough. Do you know what it does to a quarterback when he comes out in the third quarter and he has two picks up on that scoreboard instead of one? I go, no. And he goes, it messes him up. I go, well, he's thinking about the wrong stuff then, dad. Who the hell cares about stats? You need to keep throwing the ball. And I fully believe that. Uh, five years later, hey, I'm not calling that a Hail Mary. That just messed up. My quarterback had two picks that weren't his fault. Then he threw a third on a Hail Mary. And now I can't get him to throw the ball in the second half. Oh, man, my dad was right. I get what he's talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think that encapsulates a lot of probably like some of the nerds versus others is yeah, we would say, like, who cares if you throw an interception? It's win probability doesn't go down at all. And even if you have one hundredth of one percent, you know, one point chance of increasing your your score, why not do it? And it sounds like he was kind of maybe a little bit more of that mentality and then has switched more as time has gone on. I mean, I do think he's he talks about getting aggressive to being conservative. I think that comes out of maybe some of the fourth down stuff, maybe some of the play calling stuff. Um yeah, did did you sense that that too? He he really seems like someone who's gone through a pretty big a shift, I guess, over time as he's been around, and maybe he's kind of like become his. He's more similar to probably who his dad was when he was growing up in that way. Yeah, you know, it's interesting as he. A lot of people really like that part uh, yeah. for a lot of th a lot of the reasons that you said too. Like, I think that actually, even though we don't specifically discuss. And overtly discuss analytics. I think they permeate the series, frankly, yes. because yeah. it's human thought and decision making and process. And but and and so even even though they're not overt about what they study and in terms of um, those probabilities, things like that, um, it's it's everywhere through the course of their of their discussion about how they think about being a play caller. 
Um, and you can hear, you know, Sean McVay. I mean, we know he, other than that famous fourth, fourth and one, he never goes for it on fourth, on fourth down. Well, he also is the one who's talking the most about emotion in, in play calling. Sean McVay, he's also the one who, um, you know, went out and got the quarterback who could throw the ball the heck downfield with any sort of arm angle you want. And their offense became more predicated on specifically explosive pass plays out of drop back stuff and empty and those types of things. And again, it matches exactly what Sean's telling you who he is and sort of what he focuses on and what he prioritizes when we think about the conversations between um, analytics and tendencies and, and someone going off of feel and, you know, we, we hear that. And so um, with, with Kyle, um, a lot of people really liked that conversation for a lot of reasons and thought that in, in some ways, maybe it was, it was funny and, and all of that. A part of me thought what he's doing uh, his dad, it's funny. Yeah, of course, of course. (laughs) But a part of me almost also felt kind of sad hearing it, frankly, Yeah. because um, he's going back there to having conversation uh, in his life with his dad. He's doing his dad's voice, which, yes, is objectively funny. Um, And he gets the yelling down pretty accurately. (laughs) But like it also made me for some reason, it made me feel sad also because you're thinking about you start to really think about how in, entrenched Mike Shanahan's identity is within Kyle. Um, and you really hear it in that moment, along with all the other stuff and the, the, the funny stuff is there too, certainly, but like you really start to hear it, I think in, in small moments like that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I do think there is like a little bit of a higher degree of, and maybe this is also having an old school sort of mentality of having a certainty about things. And it maybe it even flip from being certain that aggressive is the right thing and now being very, very certain that conservative is the right thing and, and how he flips there. Whereas I think Sean and 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 Matt and Mike, they all, at least in how they talk about things, it's a little bit more like a little bit more of the millennial, let's say, comes out yeah. as far as, 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 when, as when they're the talking. Why guys, yeah. yeah, the why guys. yeah. Now, so, so transitioning over to, to Sean, um, and I, I just think it's very interesting. First of all, is it not just me? I mean, I knew that he sounded like John Gruden, but he really like, I just can't help but think like a, like a not as uh, a less exaggerated version of John Gruden whenever I'm hearing talking. So I'm sure, you know, broadcasting and everything will be in his future here. Now, if someone was a genius, maybe he would be the closest person to like legitimately like an IQ sort of genius. I thought there was an interesting anecdote from from Matt LaFleur about, you know, they were talking about let's name off all the all the I don't know if it was play action plays or something like that. He's like, oh, he could obviously do it. And no one else could could there. But at the same time, what seemed to happen with that Super Bowl loss maybe shows even if you are that genius and no matter how open you may be and you know you're you're a millennial you're you're into all these ideas and the whys of everything but to be crushed like that i really thought it was interesting the flip side of that and i think you've even talked about how these practices in 2020 where that when when they came back and they were really letting it rip again the, the defense against the offense that was really something that stood out to you and maybe have been also the seeds eventually leading to this, this podcast series. Yeah. That was where this idea started um, was th- when I was standing out there on those practice fields. Um, the building is like, and we talked about this, the bu- the building is overrun with wildlife. Like at one point a hawk killed a squirrel right in front of me and then swooped with it like five feet from my head. Um, which, so I was sitting there and I was like, wow, what this is like gone from <laughs> <laughs> the metaphors are too much right now. Like I'm, I'm like, wow, nature, you're a little too on the nose right now, a little too heavy here. But, but, um, yeah, it was, it was so. Um, there was just this current, right, that just permeated through the entire space, and and it was very much driven by um, Sean McVay and that obsessiveness to figuring out how others would prob- problem solve against him and how to problem solve against others. And that system at that time, specifically that 2020 version of what the Rams ran on defense, um, that specifically embodied um, how he felt and what had happened to him. <laughs> and and it, it specifically embodied the thing that he most wanted to understand, to deploy against others. Um, but also it was something that he wanted to almost like let it hurt him over and over and over and over and over again 
that constant reminder of your failure every single day that you show up to work, the place that's like supposed to be your haven that you've built this entire ecosystem and everyone in that building exists to support him. And then all of a sudden you've invited this, this manifestation of the thing that hurt you the most into the building and you have to fail every single day. And to me, um, you know, the toll of that obviously is significant uh, for a variety of reasons. But to me, that was probably one of the most interesting things I've ever seen a coach do in terms of a decision that they've made and what became of that, the ripple effect from that decision. It was so uh, apparent, all of the things that happened because he made that choice to bring something into his space um, that he knew would remind him of his failure and, and what that did to him. And it, it was interesting too. Um, you know, we talked about the, the memorization thing and the, the photographic memory. And one thing he said that was interesting, he didn't make it in the series, but I'm happy to share it here. One thing he said that was really interesting was I talked to him about, you know, how people, you know, had brought up these stories, how they'd test each other and all of that. And he kind of sat for a minute and he said, well, everyone always wants to talk about my memory, but, you know, I really worked hard to remember those things. Mm-hmm. And it was that that duality, right? There's a little layer there where you sit there and you think, oh, yeah, well, you know, he, he's not willing to he's not willing to say he has a, a photographic memory. He what he wants to have have it be said is how hard he worked to study those things. Um, and so I, I found that to be interesting, too. I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent now. But um, to your point, yeah, I, I you know, that was a pivotal moment and, and certainly the the inspiration for the story. <laughs> no, no, but I think I think that's a good that's a good point. And it le- I mean, it also reflects kind of what I was talking about earlier about how people can be different but still successful in this role because being having a photographic memory is not the most important thing about being a head coach or being a, a successful coach. It's the other things, the things that that jumps out in his mind that is the most important thing. Because like, if I was as smart as Sean McVay and had a photographic memory, I'd just be trying to figure out how to work the least amount that I could possibly do <laughs> no, and, make, make money, and make money based <laughs> upon that. Very bad head coach. It would not go well for, 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 for a head coach as far as that goes. Now, one of the things that I want to hit on, because I forgot I have this clip here from Andrew Whitworth talking about those practices is, and this is where... Again, you can never be certain what's right, what's wrong, but in a way, like McVeigh and having this failure constantly wash over him over and over again and improve based upon that, um, maybe that's that works for him. Um, maybe it's like a masochistic sort of thing that, that can help motivate him, but it may not work so great for everyone. I think that's probably part of being a head coach is adjusting to – you know, your quarterback and your offense and other things there. So I'm going to play this clip really quickly from, from what we're talking about the effect that it may have had on the offense. And that was like their, by far their worst year offensively that, that 2020 season. Those practices became in some ways, I actually think offensively it hurt us a little bit because it became like, how do we create the hardest possible scenario for us offensively all the time? And it kind of took away a little bit of our confidence because it's like, all right, we're constantly in practice every day, getting worst case scenarios or toughest look you could get. Yeah. So it was like, and then, you know, obviously with golf, he had his worst year by far and he's kind of bounced back now, now, now in Detroit there. I mean, do you, was that kind of effectively the end there? Do you th- not that he he ruined you like Jared Goff, but maybe <laughs> there's a part of that it being you know it being irreparable at that point. Yeah, well, first of all, I think Jared in himself through is a great story for you know to to look at too, and like you know that dude got to some low places uh, that through that twenty two that 2020 season, and then now seems to be thriving, right? Like, so that's, that's great. But it also, well, you also hit on apportioning credit and how that works and the yeah. the play call thing and the headset and you had RG3 talk, but that was, that was awesome. I, I was going to clip that too, but I didn't, but go, go ahead. <laughs> Feel free. Take whatever yeah. you want, man. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just happy it's done. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think um, to me, I will always be convinced that those practices were, were what really split them apart for good. Because it, it, it not in a not, not not in a hostile way. I think we all want to relitigate and have there be good guys and bad guys and whatever. But that's not really what this was. The pace has changed. You had a coach again. Anything he did, the team inherently was built to and exists to operate around him as the center of its solar system. That's that's Sean McVay. 
And the pace at which he needed to work, the pace at, at which he needed to problem solve, because he felt Mike McDaniel says it a little bit later, like it, it, it took t- like literal time off of it took him a year and a half to get back um, to and, and that was lost time. And his, so the pace changed, right? The, the, the problems needed to be solved faster. And so when you have your pace change as a coach who, again, is the center of the solar system there. Um, when the quarterback's pace doesn't match it anymore, the pace was okay. You know, you're still a young developing quarterback, even though you went to Super Bowl super early in your career, you're still young and you're still growing and you're still learning how to work and how to be and what you need to do and how to think and, and you're still developing, but everything around you now, there is this undercurrent, this undertone, this darkness really of get back get back there and win it and have, have all the answers you need. Um, build, build everything from your scheme to your philosophy to the players you have on your roster to naturally have any answer that you could possibly need to solve any problem that could possibly face you. Um, and, and you saw it in the type of quarterback he went after, Sean McVay went after. Like someone who'd seen it all, right? Someone who could make every throw. And so I think that was really what it was, is that their pace has changed. And so when you we talk in history about, you know, Jared being kind of a casualty, well, the whole offense in a way was, of, and Whitworth sums it up really, I think, really beautifully and poignantly in that, those simple words that what he said. Um, but when we talk about Jared Goff being a casualty of it, it's because the pacing changed. And this is not new in football, but, it, but, but like I said, it's so unique with these guys because it's all out in front of you <laughs> the whole time. They're showing you their work the entire way. Um, and so I think that that's what's interesting because now that you've seen Jared go to a place where pace is not the most important undercurrent because they were always going to be building, he had time to get back on track with a, in a place that the pace of it in terms of where it was in its team building model sort of more so matched, I think, where he was in his developing model. And I think that's a question that we don't think about enough when we talk about quarterbacks, but it's super, super apparent here. Um, and it's, it's certainly a um, it, it thing too, because all these other guys, you kind of hear them allude to it or talk about it. Like they're all kind of one eye on each other, like looking and, and watching and studying. And, and frankly, the openness with which Mike McDaniel discussed what had happened um, with, with Sean, especially with that, you know, in that Super Bowl that they lost, um, to me, I, I had to, I had to think and had to wonder as we continue the conversation, um, how much of that also informed how he was going to treat Tua Tagovailoa's development. Um, so it, all of it, yeah, definitely a uh, crucial, crucial point definitely was, um, I, I will always believe that it was those practices specifically versus the games themselves that really caused that final splitting off point. Okay. Do, do, do you have time for a couple yeah, of yeah. little Let's clips go. from the other guys? Sorry. I know. Yeah. I know that, that, no, I you're good. To, this is great. It's like, there's too much to talk. <laughs> I, like I knew we were going to talk for longer than I thought we we're going to talk anyway, but I want to talk about some of the other guys. I think, I think Kyle and Sean are kind of the, the, the two big fixtures on here. Um, I'm going to go to, to Matt next. And if anything, like he, he's kind of, he's interesting because he's as old as Kyle. He's a month older than Kyle. So that's another thing that's, but very much so said, even from his first moment of being around Kyle, he was like, whoa, this guy is, you know, leaps and bounds ahead of me. As far as my knowledge being underneath two of those, the guys going, you know, into, in, t- in Tennessee, uh, coordinating a like an okay offense, but they hadn't even really broken out with with Tannehill at, at that point before he came to Green Bay. But I do think his personality type, again, you, you never know how they're going to match up well to work with someone like Aaron Rodgers. And he talks about the compromise here. And I have a clip of him talking about how this works. Actually, it's like two things merged together where he's talking about 2019 and how things were a little bit rough and then into 2020. Um, I guess I just don't even know whether or not someone like Kyle, even though he did have the, the Matt Ryan thing, um, if he would articulate it in the same sort of you know manner and 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 his his ability to maybe subsume himself a little bit and then in talking about working with others here. So we'll 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 we'll, we'll, talk, we'll let Matt talk Myself, about myself. It was Aaron. It was Nathaniel Hackett and Luke Getzey, and we did all this over Zoom. And we would spend hours going through every concept that we thought we wanted to run and why we wanted to run it, getting feedback from Aaron. And, you know, some he didn't like. And we just said, all right, let's cross that one out and go on to the next one. And But 
we definitely had a much better understanding of why we were calling it, why we liked it, what we were trying to attack, and what we didn't like it against. And then found out specifically what he felt the most comfortable with. Because I do think if the guy in the huddle, the guy that's calling the play, if he feels comfortable and confident in the play call, those guys, those other 10 men in the huddle can feel that. Actually, this was just the 2020 clip. I, I clipped out the part about 2019 where the offense was okay. Their record was really good in 2019, but the offense was as good. And this is the 2020 thing. Yeah, I, I wonder how many coaches would be able to work well with Rodgers. And in some ways, if you're the, the the more confident, maybe overconfident type of coach coming in there, and I think we saw things come to a head with Mike McCarthy and the inability to kind of get on the same page. He really seems like a guy who slots in there as being a great fit with someone like, like Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. You know what? Matt came off differently than most of the other guys in a lot of ways. And part of it was because of the timing of when I arrived for the interview. It was like three days after my colleague, Matt Schneidman dropped that massive story for the athletic about the, the rush. I was like, what am I walking into here? (laughs) And so, and Matt did it obviously did a great job with that story, but um, it was there. It was hard to put a a description on what it felt like, but it was definitely there there. They were turning a page at that point. Um, And so that was really interesting because I think Matt was more willing to, to be candid about, where he's looking next and the ideas that he's trying to seek out next. And he's very open about like what other teams he's studying. And he had all these clips pulled up and it was really cool to, to watch film with them and, and to talk about some of those things. Um, but at the same time, you had this overarching sense of um, unlike, I think mo- most of these guys, a lot of Matt's journey as a coach um, has been about compromise and it, it what it's not just the very public compromise that we've seen over the years with between himself and, and Aaron Rodgers in terms of how they they changed the scheme and put a lot of things in that that Aaron Rodgers prefers took a, took some stuff out that he didn't like um, and and we're constantly evolving that and troubleshooting that and, and having conversations about that um, which I any coach should be doing with their quarterback in the first place by the way but it was way more public because of the status of that quarterback and and the legacy that he has um, and how openly particular he has been about some of those things. Um, But Matt LaFleur also did this with Matt Ryan. And in fact, Kyle Shanahan, after watching you, you'll hear, you hear Robert Griffin, the third say this in in the episode where Matt LaFleur really was a stabilizing force for him as his quarterbacks coach. And, and Kyle sees that and he takes, he hires Matt LaFleur in Atlanta where Matt LaFleur is the one who's working directly with Matt Ryan every second of the day, you know, whereas Kyle, you know, as the offensive coordinator, obviously you're, you're doing a lot of work with the quarterback, but the quarterback's coach specifically, the way that these guys all run their staffs, that's the direct contact. And then Matt sort of took that with him as that direct contact, but also, you know, has Nathaniel Hackett at that point. So building more layers of that, that compromise and, and they're, he's doing this over and over and over again. And so I think that's what kind of sets him up and positions him a little bit differently because with all of these guys, even Sean McVay, who, you know, there are some great stories about how he empowered his players to, to come up with, with new ideas, but you're still not fully, I mean, on the one hand, you, you're getting to, to install a different type of like mid zone run, but on the other hand, you're, you're getting in screaming matches with him at practice over a different idea that you had. Right. With, with all of those guys, even Sean, and especially we know this with Kyle, and, and even with Mike McDaniel, frankly, scheme is always the personality trait that is the dominating force when we talk about the ecosystems of these teams as they start their head coaching careers. Every single person except for Matt LaFleur because he went in and he kind of tried it and it didn't really work, so they had to restart it and it became about compromise. So that's where I think he kind of separates himself a little bit in this group. And, and that's why I also think it, I'm so curious, not only to see how Rogers is with another coach, he's although it's, you know, Nathaniel Hackett, like he, he loves that guy. So, you know, that, that, that will obviously be fine, but I'm curious to see how that goes, but I'm also curious to see who Matt LaFleur is, you know, <laughs> because um, who are you without, you know, a, a major piece as a football person um, being about someone else. And so I think that's going to be really interesting moving forward. 
Yeah, yeah. It's part of this credit division thing that we talked about where if it's McVay or it's Shanahan, they're quarterbacks in a way. If things go wrong, it's the, it's more the quarterback's fault in a way. And if things go right, it's more the coaches uh, uh, to their benefit and maybe to their credit. And maybe it's the same. We'll see how it goes with Green Bay. It's, I, I love that you you linked it to Atlanta because that's what I'm thinking of also is the fact that 2015 with, with Shanahan's first year as offensive coordinator there – the offense wasn't that good, honestly. It was like okay, and especially for Matt Ryan. There's a little Matt, not Matt Ryan slander, but I'm gonna have to uh, talk to Mina about the fact of just saying he's a good quarterback. I mean, you know, he's kind of like Hall of Fame Jason <laughs> at this point. It had some good seasons before that, but to really being taken to that next level. So it is interesting to think like the counterfactual, if LaFleur wasn't there and it was just Shanahan, would it have just been this for for another season or not? And I think that's Again, it's another quality that you don't necessarily, that's not the genius sort of quality, but is necessary depending upon your adaptability to, to the different to the different circumstances there. Um, okay, last, we'll go to Mike McDaniel. As I said, the guy like- I'm so excited. I've been waiting because I, I loved what you clipped out from him. And I, I yeah, just, so- I, you were so thoughtful in talking about him on Twitter. So I, I've been waiting for this. Yeah, so, so yeah. I, have, I have the clip here. I'll talk about him. But again, God, I just feel like, okay, just to go back a little bit on him. See, I see him- in, in, in this weird way where he has, and I, and I mentioned this, I, I said intellectual humility, but I don't know if that's necessarily right, actually, but I think about it more. It's just he actually views the world in a way very similarly to how I would, where you're trying to really focus on what is – is like the the right way to do things and then not be influenced too much by the um, – like the collateral damage that'll come from, from all from different ways of looking at it or these kind of biases that you might, that you might have about it. But at the same time, and I, this will be part of the clip that I play. I'm not sure he's very like empathetic towards how other people could view, could view things. And I, I try not, I try to be good about this too, is to say like, yeah, I, like I think the way that I think about things is correct, but I understand, I think, why other people do things the way they do. And I'm not quite sure as he does. And I'll play this clip when he talks about the, the play callers. And this is, of course, sometimes he just needs a filter, right? He just needs to filter himself sometimes. But so, so anyway, I'll play the clip and then, and then we'll talk about it. I think it's pretty asinine when coaches think they win or lose games. And I think there's a, most of the play callers think their play calls win or lose games. And that's cool and all, but like, I don't understand how you can overweigh your contribution to the team when you've had so many examples of calling a trash play and it works or calling the perfect play and it doesn't work. So if you can rectify that your that in your brain on the front end, there's a there's a tremendous amount of liberty to to let go and just recognize this is your best educated guess. So many people involved that how short-sighted and egotistical slash dumb is it to sit there and act like your play call wins or loses the game okay i added a little i i clipped out a little thing in the middle there where he he kind of rambles a little bit let's be honest a little bit yeah (laughs) yeah, yeah. so but that he does have this like asinine dumb he talks about that another way too where I, i don't remember exactly what it was about but it was like he's not nervous ever for some reason like mm-hmm. i don't he's a weird he's a weird cat where i think Maybe that is the right way of doing things, but I think it's interesting that he doesn't seem to have this recognition of like, yeah, other people are human beings. Like they have their, <laughs> their bias in ways. People like, are fallible. It, yeah. Yeah. People think you know, they yeah. have more control over things than they really do because otherwise it's like unsettling to think that there's, that you don't, you don't have control and things like that. So what is, I don't even know where I'm going here, but anyway, I, I thought he was a very, a very interesting, interesting guy. And again, as someone who probably has a lot to prove what happens this season with, with a lot of these guys, because they made the playoffs last year, but I feel like if, if they have a really bad season this season, who knows what will end up happening with him? Yeah. So first, first of all, another behind the scenes moment, we had this for the longest time because, because Mike went first of, of the four core guys, we were obviously gathering okay. on, a lot of other people through the course of the year, but like Mike went first and um, we had, so we had this audio for months and months and um, every single time we, we would listen to it or, or talk about scripting or things like and say, try to live your life in a way that nobody ever calls you asinine with the same like 
crushing tone that he <laughs> says that word. Is, like, is he like subtweeting people or whatever? Is he like, like, I, I, I was like, is so. he talking I, I about just, other people? I that don't are, think that so. Are... I, I think he was just like, cause, cause I asked them all the same questions about, you know, and I say it in the series, like I asked them to talk about play calling and what it means to them and yeah. why it's so personal. That was one of the main questions too, is why is play calling so personal? And so they're just talking about what they think and how they feel and, and hearing them it's, you know, nine, nine or so minutes at the end of episode four. And it's still one of my favorite sequences in the entire series um, because it is so almost like startling in a way to hear them talk about this, this thing so candidly. Um, but with Mike, I think I, I would not say humility. I probably wouldn't use that word, not, yeah. not in a negative way, but I would probably mm -hmm. say, I think Mike has an understanding because of some of the life experiences he's gone through and because he comes from a different background than a lot of these guys, um, his, his upbringing and um, his childhood, all of that stuff. He, he wasn't necessarily in a football um, tunnel for the second he like stepped onto the earth. Like, and then some of the things he went through with sobriety and, and all of that, I think he has a clear, a clear view of, how football can bring out the worst tendencies in a human being and reward them for that. Um, and I think he's, he lived that experience very, very young as a, as a young coach, he lived that experience to pretty much the depths that it could take someone. Um, and so when we talk about how he views things and that clarity with which he speaks about his philosophies and, and like what you said, he is very very confident almost in a way he's very clear on who he wants to be and and frankly he's also very very clear on who he doesn't want to be because i think he's he's been that person that he doesn't want to be and he had to figure out a way to change and and not be that the the worst version of himself ever again and so i think that that's something that gives him a different perspective than everybody else has within the course of the series and i think that is something it comes out as he is clearly very proud of that because, um, and I think that's that's based off of lived experiences and the clarity with which he sees football. If you give it the chance, football will make you the worst version of yourself and it will give you the rewards, all the rewards in the world for becoming that person. So how do you not be that person? How do you instead become the best version of yourself in a game that wants you to lean into some of your worst your worst tendencies as a coach. And, and so I think that that's, um, that's a, a struggle that he's, they're all clearly battling with. Um, but I think he does look at it through a different lens because of what he's experienced in his life. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I mean, I, I'm kind of going off the deep end with some of the psychoanalysis here for him, but I mean, you mentioned like he had issues with, with alcoholism. It, I think a couple of times, honestly, I know you talk about uh, how he basically had to take a step out. He knows to the exact day, how long he was out of the NFL, but I believe he went to rehab also in 2016 or something like that. So I think there was another, I don't know if it affected his, 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 um, uh, his coaching or not, but I know there was another incident there and, you know, this again, now, like I said, I'm going off the deep end with the psychoanalysis stuff, but obviously there is, you know, like the, the whole 12 steppy sort of thing. Like one of the parts of it is kind of like accepting a higher power and, you know, it works because not because of religious necessarily, but it works kind of like understanding there are things you can't control. And he seems to almost have that sort of attitude about things of, of really being able to accept. And he talked about that even within his own job, that part of his problem before was not being able to accept having a certain role by a certain day, moving on to a certain thing, hitting all these benchmarks and these thresholds. And, and then he finally developed an attitude of, you know what, you don't worry about those, those things, you do your work. And then those things kind of take care of care of themselves. So I don't know, I thought this all tied together in some way, maybe I'm bringing it together a little too far here, but I, I thought, I thought that was an interesting possible thread between those things. Well, I wasn't sure if he was going to talk about it. And I was very cautious about even approaching the subject, but he, yeah openly brought it up. So for me, it, it can't not be connected, right? It's a, yeah. it's a thing he lived in his life. And he also was connecting it as we were talking. So I, I don't think that it's, I just think like it's, that's part of what I wanted to achieve with this is like, this is football. And if you love football, you will hopefully geek out over this like I did for over the last year. Um, but this is also life too. And it is complicated and people apply the experiences they have, whether in football or adjacent to it, 
directly to how they are existing out in front of us. And so Mike, I think is, is a very, um, uh, a very good example of somebody who is doing that, living those experiences with everything he does, whether it was his experiences working for Kyle and like it, literally his offense, it, I just, he's stretching his legs. Like he, he went out and got the fastest re receivers on the planet. He's literally yeah. stretching his legs out from, you know, out from, out from working under uh, uh, Kyle for the longest that any of them have. Yeah, I, I believe he said that the technical term was fast as shit. Was yes. The technical <laughs> term for, for his receiver, Advanced right? football terminology all through <laughs> yes. the series. Yeah. And so, um, and, and, and so, but like it's, they're all, but that's, that's all of them. But I think Mike is because of how candid he was, I think Mike showed a really good example of what exactly that looks like and what exactly that means. Okay. I, I've, I've taken way too much of your time here. I'm going to let you go, <laughs> but thank you so much. As you can see, I enjoyed it. I got my clips. I, 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 I listened to everything there and I'm very, very excited. Not only, you know, everyone listened to this, but then I think this season, it's always a big deal for every team every year, but I do think there are lots of interesting threads going on with these guys in transition and it went for a bunch of different players and different quarterbacks that they've been involved with to see to see how they perform this year. So I think it's extremely relevant to what we're going to see now coming up in the 2023 season. Yeah, um, I, I, not, the, to, not to cut ahead. you off. I'm sorry. Yeah. But one thing, too, it's like if you listen to the series and I hope you do. And thank you so much to everybody who already has. And thank you, too, for being so detailed in your questions and, and the clips and all of that. It's wonderful. Um, but as you listen to it, depending on how next year goes you will understand if they succeed and why they succeeded. And also you will understand if they fail, why they fail over the, it's like a Rorschach test almost like the way that you, the way that this, uh, hopefully it holds up as they say. Um, but, but it, it's, when you listen to the series, you could, you could say, oh yeah, if, 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 you know, they, one or more of them completely um, implode next year, you actually will understand why it happened because of the way that they, um, the way that you will hear them talk and the way that you'll you'll see how they work. Um, so I, I thought that was also a fascinating element through the course of reporting. I was like, hey, this could go either way, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> that's life, as, as they say. And I think, again, I think you did a good job not painting this like, ah, these guys are geniuses. They're going to go on and win all the Super Bowls for the next, you know, 20 year sort of situation where uh, we, we know well enough by now, I think seeing lots of great <laughs> coaches or quarterbacks or whoever, that there's some ups and downs that, that, that come along the way. Um, okay, follow Jordan on Twitter at Jordan Rodrigue. That's with J O U R D A N, uh, the athletic. And you're going on vacation, right? Or no? Yes, thank God. Okay. I am finally well I'm deserved. <laughs> you're supposed to be taking the last like two months off, like I have, um, kind of, but it, it, good vacation and be re, re, re energized and recharged for the season. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. Like I said, I'm a big fan of your work. So this was great. Enjoyed the conversation. And thank you again for listening to the play callers out at the athletic. Um, right now, all five. You can listen to them all at once. You have your own feed. You got your own feed now. <laughs> yeah, rate us, review us. We love it. Thank you guys so much. All right, thanks, thanks, George.